That was good. That was good. Amen. That was good. All right. If you have your Bible, and I hope you have, the Word of God, if you'll turn with me to John chapter number 3 and verse number 19. John 3, 19. John 3, 19. John chapter number 3. And verse number 19, Scripture says, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Father, bless this book now, in thy name I pray, Lord. Amen. You can be seated. In 1828, Noah Webster, who's a very honorable, we owe a lot to Mr. Webster, tried to standardize the English language and come out with a dictionary. Diction, the way you pronounce a word. The English language has gone through three major divisions, Old English, Middle English, and Modern English. Yeah. They tell us that Modern English started with the King James Bible, uh, these and the thous and all of that. Well, but, uh, you know, they also say that I think a sixth grade education, you can read the King James Bible pretty good. It's written at about that level. Well, so, uh, of course, things have changed a good bit. I don't know. When in this country now, we've got something like I forget what the last figure was, 30 to 40% of the people are functionally illiterate. Uh, we've come a long way, haven't we? But it's sad. But if you go to Webster's Dictionary and find the, the uh, definition of the word condemn, now this is in 1828. If you get a modern dictionary, you're going to find a modern put, twist put on it. Don't trust it. Throw it away. Get you an old dictionary if you want to deal with the English language, and you'll find out what, uh, what the word means. Here are three things that Mr. Webster gives us in 1828 on condemn. Number one, to declare to be reprehensible, wrong, or evil, usually after weighing evidence and without reservation, to declare to be reprehensible. Number two, to pronounce guilty, to convict, to condemn. And then number three is to sentence a prisoner to die. These are three major elements that have to do with condemnation, to condemn in the English language. And the Bible was written in the English language. And so, my friend, when the word condemnation comes up in the New Testament, written by the uh, King James translators, 1611, they're using the same definitions that Mr. Webster used, to standardize the English language. Condemn has not changed its meaning. We live, in a, we live in a society today where everything is foggy and political correctness and all of that garbage. But the word has not changed its meaning. It yeah. still means the same thing. Yeah. And so once again, we read in John chapter number 3 and verse 19, this is the condemnation. That's a strong word. That's a bad word. Yeah. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light Amen. because their deeds were evil. This light judges the motive of men. Right. That's quite a remarkable thing when you think about it. When you read the Bible, the Bible reads you. How many ever got that idea? How many ever figured that out yet? And the Bible's reading you, and the more light you have, the more accountable you are. But the truth of the matter is, when you reject what light you have, you get no more light. And this is the issue here in John 3, 19, that this is the condemnation. This is the judgment. This is the damnation. This is what leads you to death. And that is that you reject the light because your motive, you love darkness rather than light. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 9, the scripture says, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. What is this? Well, the apostle Paul wrapped up all of the Old Testament, the law, and he said it is a ministration of condemnation. In plain words, you could never run to the law for comfort because by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. The only thing the law could ever do, you is tell, do for you is tell you what you've done and then convict you for it. But it found no way out from it. Of course, God had his reasons for this. He progressively deals with man. It's taken us a long time to get to where we are. There's a whole lot more to know about God than what we know about him right now. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So the ministration of condemnation... And so we find that in Romans chapter number 2 and verse number 15. Notice the application of this. In Romans chapter number 2, two and verse 15, which show the work of the law. Yeah. 
written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. What's the work of the law? Condemnation. So we read in Romans chapter number two, and it has to do with a someone, if you read it carefully, that has no real clear understanding or knowledge of the gospel. The preaching of the word of God has not come to them yet. These are the people that are in the darkness, yet they have a conscience. That conscience is connected with the law. You notice carefully? That conscience tells them what is right and what is wrong. Conscience, my friend, doesn't tell them who Christ is until they hear who Christ is. But the point is this, that the work of the law is written in their conscience, and it bears witness to them that their thoughts accuse or excuse them one or the other. We're accountable to God. You're not the dog. You're not the cat. Even though this cultural, this degraded generation doesn't make a difference anymore. You're not a dog. You're not a cat. You're a human being made in the image of God. You're far, far more accountable than anything walking this earth. You are accountable. What do you understand about that? The Bible said in John chapter number 8 and verse number 9, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. See what the conscience did to them? It convicted them. What did convict them? I don't know what he wrote. Nobody knows what he wrote in the ground. Whatever he did, whatever he wrote in the ground, had to do with the law. It had some connection with it because it condemned every one of them. It convicted them. Better way to put it, he convic- it convicted them. So what's God doing with us? This is important to understand the little difference in the meaning of what's going on. Why did Christ come into this world? The Bible said in Romans chapter number 1, verse number 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now compare this to John 8, 9. When these men drugged this woman taken in adultery, was she guilty? Sure, she's guilty. Can you make excuses for it? No excuses made. She's guilty. Caught in the act. And she dra- they drag her to Christ. And then he writes something in the ground, which is some law. And it convicts their conscience. And they turn around and they walk away. And she's left with them. All right. Now I want you to go and look at carefully what it says. Romans 1, 3, 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What's the difference? What's the difference between being convicted in your conscience and walking away and then knowing the judgment of God? Well, here's the difference. It's a seared conscience. It's a seared conscience. A seared conscience. What's a sear? A sear is where you burn something no longer has any feeling. You have scar tissue in your body. You touch it, you don't feel anything. The nerves haven't grown back the way they could, they should have before. You feel it no more. Feeling is a blessing from God. Because when something's hurting, you want to find out what's wrong. And so you go to find the problem. But you see, when the conscience no longer bothers you, it no longer hurts you, you're not bothered with it anymore, then you have a seared conscience. Then, my dear friend, you slam the door in God's face. You've turned the light out in your life. You've said no to the Almighty. You said, I'm going to live the way I intend to live, and I don't care what you say about it. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I'm going to take pleasure in those that do it too. Take that is their attitude toward God. That's their attitude, friend. Now listen, that is the country you live in. That's where you live today, seared conscience, seared, who knowing the judgment of God. Now, don't you look at something carefully now. John 8, verse 11. She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You see, the Bible says in John chapter number 3 and verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You've got plenty to condemn you. There's plenty to tell you who and what you are. Oh, yes, there's an awful lot of stuff out there. you got a conscience that tells you it's wrong. You ever get a hold of the Bible, that's going to teach you something. That's light. 
And when you have this, this is what makes you ready for the one who's not going to come and condemn you. He's going to come to save you. That's what he's saying. He didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is why he said to the woman, neither do I condemn thee. You see? He didn't say, I approve of thee. He didn't say, I condone thee. But he said, I do not condemn thee. Amen. I didn't come to condemn you. I came, I came to be a way out. Yes. Yes. I came for that one that's in the darkness and they're looking for the light. Yes. I came for that one whose life is a mess and they need help. I am the one. Right. Not here's your enemy, I'm here's your friend. He's a friend of sinners. If you can introduce some, don't forget about your church. Forget about the great man. Introduce them to Christ. Tell them about the Lord Jesus who bore their sin on the cross. You say, preacher, he did, boy, you don't know what I did. I'm making a difference what you did. I'm not, it's not an issue of me. He bore your sin. He became sin for us who knew no sin. That's what a man in darkness needs to hear. That's what a woman in darkness needs to hear. Are you taken in adultery? Have you been caught with a thief? Are you a liar? Are you a deceiver? Somewhere, somehow, it doesn't make any difference what you've done. Christ came to save you, Amen. not condemn you. Plenty around to do that. But they come into the church sometimes, you sorry, low down piece of garbage. What are you doing in here? You know, we got a clean church here. Well, my dear friend, let me ask you a simple question. If you're unclean, where do you go? You don't go to CBS, NBC, and ABC. Where do you go? News media, where do you go? You know, the Hill over here, University of Tennessee? Sure, they serve their purpose. There's a lot of good there. But do you think that place is going to save you? Where do you go? Come unto me, all you that labor in a heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn to be for I'm meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest to your souls. Amen. Amen. Condemnation. John chapter number 16, verse 8, has got a little nuance to this. Look at this, John 16, 8. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now you go to a Greek lexicon, and we, this is, you know, Greek lexicon is like a dictionary. It gives you the meaning of the word and the etymology of the word and all that. Listen to this. The word reprove means to convict, refute, confute, but it's generally with a suggestion of the shame of the person convicted. Eleko is the, is the uh, Greek word. Eleko. It is a suggestion of the shame of the person convicted. When you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not only rejecting a Savior no. theologically. You're rejecting one who took your hell into his body on the cross. You're rejecting the one who loved you like nobody ever loved you. When you reject the Lord Jesus Christ, you are showing the depths of your soul. Yeah. Are you listening? Yeah. You're showing what you're made out of. You're showing what matters to you. You're showing what you value. To reject the Lord Jesus Christ is to reject, my friend, the love of all the ages, the king of the universe, yeah. the one who went to the cross for you. You're not just rejecting a man. To reject him is a shameful thing. That's what John 16, 8 means. So this is the condemnation. Christ is coming to the world. And men love themselves. They love the world. They love stuff. As John said, love not the world, things within the world, love of the world. It's not, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, all these things. Make up all the elements of the world. You're full of the world. You're full of yourself. And that's all you care about. Till God can bring you low. Now here's an issue called attitude. First is condemnation, then there's attitude. John, Matthew 15, 26. He answered and said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Most people have turned away right then. Said, that's it. I tried. And, you know. I gave it a fair shot. I went to church a while, read the Bible. I even went down and prayed in the altar. 
you know, I gave him, I gave him a try. Didn't work for me. If it works for you, if that's your truth, <laughs> you know, relativism, if that's your truth, no, it's not my truth. It is the truth. What he did for me, he'll do for you. But Matthew 20, 15, 26, not me to take the children's bread to cast it there. Anybody ever had a, a situation where they should have been depressed? It was this woman. But a dog has a way of getting to you. How many of you got dogs for friends? I saw a sign the other day said, a dog uh, is a friend, has, a, has an owner. That's what it was. A dog has an owner, and a cat has a staff. How many of you ever tried to get a cat to love you and the cat didn't want a thing to do with you, all right? Cat has to choose to. Dogs, dogs. Listen to Matthew 15, 27. She said, truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. What a woman. What a woman. <laughs> After she'd been rejected, humiliated, she said, that's all right, Lord. That's okay. I am a dog. I'm a dog. I know that. But I'm appealing to something inside you that goes past the law. It goes past Judaism. It goes past the kingdom of heaven. It goes past your 12 disciples. It goes past everything that I've ever known. I'm appealing to your heart and to your soul. Yeah. And if you want to get a hold of God, that's the way to appeal to him, yeah. to his heart and to his soul. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. I'll run with the dogs any day if I can gain the ear of Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Ho, ho, ho. Amen. I'm a dog. If that's what it takes to get a hold of him, yeah. I'll do it. So what do you mean by that? I'll humble myself if I have to. Yeah. And you know the truth of the matter, if I don't have a relationship with God, I'm going to have to. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I said to a man one time, we got a pro problem with pride. He said, oh, yeah, we all got a problem with pride. Passing it off like it's nothing. No, pride is your worst enemy. Yeah. And the foundation of pride is you. Yeah. You. Ego. Ego. Yeah. Me. Yeah. I. Yeah. I am. And so I'm not a dog, but if I have the attitude of the woman, I can reach God. I know that. I know I'm a child of God, but I need that attitude. James 4 verse 6 says this, but he giveth more grace. For wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Stop declaring your rights. Stop commanding this and commanding that. Stop demanding this and demanding that. I've never seen such an arrogant crowd today in my life. Get on the knees and crawl in a hole somewhere. And say, Lord, I'm just me. Amen. If a man says he hath no sin, he deceives himself. Right. If a man says he has not sin, he calls God a liar. That's, right. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. Lord, as Abraham said, I'm just dust and ashes. Oh, God, I, I don't claim any. I don't claim anything great with you. I know you call me out of the Chaldees, but I know what I am. I'm just dust and ashes. Lord, would you remember these poor souls down here in Sodom? He was interceding for somebody. Abraham had taken the place of a dog, folks. No question about it. And then there's the issue of identity. This is the last one. Condemnation, attitude, and then identity. Young people grow up today under what's called peer pressure. Peer pressure. I got an email from a man the other day, and he said, you offended me in what you said about such and such. I thought to myself, is that supposed to mean something to me? The generation I grew up in, that didn't mean squat. Are you kidding? I offended him. Ha! Are you kidding? They get on social media and they'll rag you, they'll drag you across the coals. Drag on! Man. At least thank God I grew up in that generation where you could say whatever you wanted to and call anybody you wanted to call them. And you better have thick hide if you're going to make it anywhere and you're going to do anything. And that's the way it was. Offended him. Good. Is that supposed to mean I'm supposed to do something about that? Listen, if this Bible offends you, too bad. Too bad. Too bad. Too bad. I don't intend to offend you. I take no pleasure in, in, in something of that nature. But folks, make no mistake about it today. I couldn't care less about how somebody's offended and this culture today and all of this Mickey Mouse garbage that's going on on social media. Folks, kids are killing themselves. 
teenagers are killing themselves because of that social garbage. They call them the social media mob comes against them. They're killing themselves, the peer pressure. I mean, I'll tell you why you have it, because you don't yet know who you are. How do you mean that, preacher? You take a teenager growing up today, you're not really sure who you are because you just know that you have a culture you're in. You have pressure to conform from that culture. You feel it every day of your life. And so here you are. You're alive in 2022, okay? When 1964, I was 17. 2022, some of you are 17. There's a big difference between 1964 and 2022. <laughs> no comparison. But you are being pressured on every side. Every generation has its own music. It has its own heroes. It has its own culture. Why does it do that? Because it's making a statement, this is my generation. My generation. My generation. So what does all that mean, preacher? That means that your identity as you begin to mature in Christ, you begin to mature in your brain, your mind begins to mature. You understand how contemporary it really is. Look at that word contemporary. What is temporary? Here today and going tomorrow, right? Contemporary means with the temporary, of the temporary. In other words, the contemporary society of 2022 is fading away. Your music is fading away. I guarantee you there's not one in this house could tell me what the top 10 songs were January the 1st of, of, of 1980. You have no idea. 1990, 2000, 2010. You don't know. Why? Because it didn't mean anything to you. Fade it away. It's gone. So what's all that mean, preacher? That means you get your identity from this. Ephesians 3, 8 says unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul said, I am who I am. I am what I am, not by my culture, not by the pressure of coming from of when I 2,000 years ago. I am who I am by the grace of God. Now, young people, you're going to die. You're going to see friends that you love die. You're going to lose family members. You're going to be hurt. You're going to have people say things about you you don't like. You're going to lose jobs. You're going to be short on money. You're going to hurt in your body. You may get sick. You're going to have pain. These are all the things that make up life. So, you know, I don't want a 15-year-old telling me what life is about. No, 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 no. No, no. You ain't even started. And I'm not trying to be smart with you. But I'm telling you something. There's a whole lot in front of you. And life is not a bowl of cherries. Now, you've been around a while. You know what I'm talking about. Amen. It's not a bowl of cherries. Life is not some of this fleeting, ethereal joy. Live off. No, no, no. Life can get hard and tough. So what do you do with it? How do you live it? The only thing that stands sure that doesn't change is the Lord God himself. Galatians 6, 3 says, If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Well, I'll tell you what, buddy. I've built some churches, and I'm telling you right now, I've been all over the world, and I'll tell you right now, i got a reputation. And I'll tell you this, I'll tell you that. Yeah, I know you'll tell me. <laughs> You're telling me. <laughs> and you want me to listen. That's a problem killing us today, folks. Too many preachers full of themselves. They're full of themselves. They're full of themselves. They're full of themselves. Full of themselves. Full of themselves. Amen. The Apostle Paul said, For to me to live... It's basketball. There's nothing wrong with basketball. I loved it. I had basketball day and night. That's all I thought was in the world was basketball. I mean, day after day, I, I knew all the teams. I was in basketball. Then I got old and fat, and I couldn't play it anymore, so what do you do? <laughs> Paul said, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He was the same yesterday, today. And forever. When I was 17 years old, 64, the same Christ then, bless his righteous name, 
could save to the uttermost. Yes. I didn't have any use for him. I had to go on further. I had to go another 10 years past 17. I was 27 years old. I had to go in the military for four years. I had to learn. I had to hit some hard times. And then I was ready when he came to me. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And a man thinking himself to be something when he's nothing deceiveth himself. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 11, I'm become a fool in glory. You've compelled me. For I ought have been commended of you, for nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Yeah. Now, preacher, I wouldn't think that the apostle Paul was nothing. He wrote half the New Testament. Right. In the sight of God, God has his rating for Paul. But in Paul's mind, Paul knew where he was, where yeah. he was by the grace of God. He had directly been involved in the killing of people, and he knew it was solely by grace. Yeah for him to be where he was. 1 Timothy 1.13, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. In plain words, I didn't have a seared conscience, though I was full of zeal for what I was doing. I'm talking Paul, speaking first person for him. Though I was full of zeal, I did not have a seared conscience. Didn't have it. Thank God. How do you know he didn't? Because God opened his heart and he received him. Finally, in Romans 1 32, give you this comparison, then I'll be quiet. I want to compare this when Paul said, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Dear friend, dear friend, there is a gospel that changes not, it doesn't change. It doesn't take any more for God to save somebody in 1950 than it does in 2022. Yeah. Not a bit. Not a bit. Blood of Christ was shed for all men. How about coming today and doing something with him? Amen. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Some of you know how bad it's getting out there. Now here's the problem with this. If you let it work you, carry you, surround you, infest you, if you let it take hold of your mind, there will come a time when you will become seared and then you'll be proudly walking and proudly declaim, proclaiming and proudly proud of your of this culture and so forth and you'll be using every term you can to condemn the preaching of the word we don't have any love in here see you, you, you up here preaching hate to people see how it's going this is just the beginning you wait it won't get better. No, Father, in thy name I pray. Yeah. Bless your holy word. And I bless thee. I bless thee because you blessed me. In thy righteous name I pray. Your heads are bowed this morning. I just, my soul, somebody needs to move. Somebody, somebody's ready for the Lord. Yes, Who are you? Where are you at? Why don't you come down here now? Let's do. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk to God. Are you listening? Are you listening with your heart and not your head? Is something moving inside you and you know it is? You've felt it before. You've heard it before. Please don't just keep putting it off because the time will come when you don't hear it anymore. No, you won't. You won't hear it anymore. And that's a sad thing. And I'm not the one that makes that call. Thank God I'm not. But you won't hear it anymore. Raise your hand and say, Preacher Lawson, don't you pray for me because God's speaking to my soul. You may not move now. That's all right. I'm not trying to fill up something. But you want me to pray? I'll pray for you. Anybody? Raise your hand and say, pray for me, Preacher Lawson. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. I can't see the people watching this thing. It's streaming live right now. There may be somebody out there. You raise your hand, and I'll pray for you. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray now. I know your word will not return void but it will accomplish that which you please and it'll prosper in the thing where to you sent it. May the Lord Jesus Christ now become the Savior and Lord of somebody who heard this message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you folks. Thank you for listening.